Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to stop here just for a quick minute. Does anyone have any questions um, about extremities, imaging, uh, matching, setting up, et cetera? Uh, so Omar, Chris has got his hand raised. <coughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, please, what um, in a situation whereby you are, you are matching now, like coming to the hip, for example, when the left side is not an exact mirror image of the right side, how do you begin to match? That is when, there is when it is very evident that the patient has an impediment on one side of the hip. How do you not match perfectly to get the two sides properly matched? Are you going to make some compensations on their side that is debilitating or what? That's a good question, Chris. Um, I caught some of it. Do you mind um, repeating that question for me? I'm sorry. Okay. You know, you know, the left side of the body can be seen as the mirror image of the right side. Now, what in, this, in an instance where you are talking about matching perfectly the hip, the ischium on both sides, and when if probably the left ischium is having a challenge, so you then how do you now perfectly match though you have properly matched with the right? Are you going to have like fillers you're going to put there or compensators on the other hip that will make a kind of image that will compensate for equality before you can make a perfect match? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of different things you could do. So if you're treating the entire pelvis um, and it's kind of hard to see and like you're treating the left side and the right side, and um, one of the things that we can remember is that when we take an AP film, that's used to establish our left shift and right shift and supinin. Um, our lateral is to set the depth or ant post. So on the AP view, if we're seeing that the hip is maybe crooked or there's some issue on one side, but the other side is matched, this is a good time to go into the room and move the patient and refilm. So you can adjust the right leg um, to, to help get everything into position. Now, when you're filming and you put everything on the AP and then you take uh, a lateral and, and they're kind of side by side, <clears throat> you can either do an on demand at a slightly different, maybe five, 10 degrees off that 90. And that will help you see both sides a little bit more clearly. Now, if you do take a 90 degree or a lateral at 270, <clears throat> sorry, pardon me, uh, a right lat or a left lat, um, there is a tip that you can use to help determine which side is which. So um, when you take an image, you have the generator and the imaging panel. The x-rays come out of the generator, go through the patient and hit the panel. The longer distance the x-ray travels, the more scatter is involved, which means when it hits that panel, it's going to be farther away from the center. What I'm basically trying to say is that the side closest to the generator will always appear slightly larger than the side closest to the imager panel. So if you're seeing two femurs, two leg bones, the leg bone that is appearing to be slightly larger is the leg bone that is closest to the generator. So if you have a supine head first patient and you're taking a right lat, the right femur, the bone is going to appear slightly larger than the left femur. And this is due to the scatter and the distance. So that's, that's a little um, trick that you can use if you're matching and you're trying to figure out which side is left, which side is right, and they're overlapping. That's a really great answer, Omar. I just learned a lot from, from listening yeah. to you, Ben. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, you're welcome. We've just got a couple of other questions um, before we move on. Um, so if we're matching in offline mode, um, would you recommend auto matching or manual matching? Um, I don't like auto match at all. <laughs> um, the reason is because it, you know, matching manually always keeps me focused. It keeps me proficient and auto matching. I think a lot of times therapists, when they use it over time, it makes them complacent. Um, they just kind of click, look at it real quick and move forward. I like to engage with the film and look at everything. So, um, but everyone's different. 
And um, so I actually don't like, and I recommend new therapists stay away from auto match for the first couple of years, um, learn the contours, the structures, learn to look at everything all together, be, you know, do it manually, become really good at matching. And then once you become um, seasoned and, and a veteran, then if you want to use auto match on certain cases, you know, go for it. It'll, it'll, it might save you some time, but I prefer doing manual matching. <clears throat> Perfect. I think that's really great advice. Thank you. Um, and another question, uh, if you're taking oblique images for extremities, uh, do you mean that you just only take a single view? There, yeah, there's, there's two different ways to do this. So um, you can either have paired imaging at an oblique. So if you do on demand on a true beam, <clears throat> the cool thing about that is you can actually add KVMV, KVKV, or, or you know, et cetera. So you can take a orthogonal pair that's sort of off axis, maybe 10 degrees, five degrees, whatever you want. Also, if you want to maybe just take one view, the lateral to kind of figure out what leg you're looking at, you could take a single image and set your depth. And so you can just hold shift one and we'll go over that later. Shift one and dragging the mouse on the film will isolate your ant post shift, which means your couch will only move ant post it will move nothing else. Uh, if you don't do that, it'll probably apply a lateral shift because you're at an angle, your film. So um, it's possible to do that. And also guys, um, use your SSDs. So if you're having a really hard time on an extremity and you're setting and you're looking at the lateral and you just can't see if which leg is which and what's going on, um, again, the point of the lateral, the purpose of it is to set the depth. Uh, you could do soup inf and uh, left, right on the AP. You can do soup inf and and post on the lateral. So if the main purpose of the lateral is to set the depth, the and post, and you just can't see anything, uh, it's always also a good idea to go in the room and maybe just set the SSD, and then you'll know that you're at the proper depth for the most part. Perfect. Thank you. Um... There was a question from Yasal about Cone Beam CT, but I might defer that one to the next session that we're running because that's all about the Cone Beam CT. Um, whereas sure. this is kind of about 2D matching. Um, and then another question, is it practical to use couch movements uh, to correct the patient position? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's always, I mean, that's what the couch is for. That's what the shifts are for but you have to make that judgment call. If you have to go into the room to fix something, if it's, if it's a rotation or if it's something that, you know, requires more than just going into the room, there are definitely some situations where you can fix everything with the couch. And there's some where you have to go in the room to actually move the patient. And again, um, I said this before, what might help you make that decision is think to yourself, if I was the one on the table being treated, would I want my therapist to come in and fix this by hand? And if you answer that honestly and correctly, then you'll, you'll probably make the right choice and either go in and fix it or use the couch <clears throat> usually. Perfect. Great answer. Um, so I think that's covered all of the questions that are in the chat um, so far. So I think we'll um, let you move on sure. to the next section. <laughs> so we, we talked about abdomen extremity. Let's go into thorax. Uh, one of the most common areas treated amongst all radiation oncology is breast. As common as it is, there are many different ways to plan, approach, and treat those cases. Uh, another very common site is lung. And these can be very challenging over the course of the treatment because um, they can change considerably over the course of the treatment. So let's actually start by looking at a spleen case and then uh, kind of go from there. <clears throat> so here's an offline review of a T-spine match for a spleen case. So we're treating the spleen, but we're using the T-spine as a guide. So as we review these images, um, how can we be certain that we're in the correct vertebral bodies? I'll just go ahead and answer that. Um, we use landmarks. So we have the floating ribs uh, here, which is a, a good one to consider. So these are um, an indicator of T12, and these can tell us kind of where we are. 
Um, the diaphragm is pretty clear, but we don't really want to rely on this. Um, we we want to stay away from that because they move a lot and they're going to appear to be different every time we film. So I would uh, maybe avoid that. <clears throat> um, another one, so this is the floating ribs, would be maybe the carina. So if you were imaging higher up, more superiorly, carina is a great tool to use to uh, as a landmark to make sure they're aligned. And then down below, we can use the pelvic crest as well. So if we had that included. <clears throat> so we can use tools such as the graticule or the ruler to help us decide how to uh, approach adjustments. The ruler here is going to tell us that our, our delta is about six centimeters, which is small, but, but decent. So there are a few ways we can apply this in the room. Uh, first, we can simply move the upper body over to the side. But remember um, to pull, <clears throat> never push. I've worked with some therapists that developed the bad habit of pushing patients rather than asking their partner for a pull. It's important to acknowledge that these are people that we're working with here and pushing a patient into position is uncomfortable for them. But more importantly, it can also move the body in very unpredictable ways. So pulling is always usually a better way to approach that. Um, moving the upper body is also very challenging, um, because it often leads to all sorts of positional changes. Some of these include bending the spine, rolling the patient, pitching the patient, maybe changing their clavicle positions and, and a lot more. And this is partly because the patient is commonly indexed up there, right? So they may be laying on some sort of device like a wing board, a Timo or a back lock and sliding them over these uneven surfaces is going to be unpredictable. So I would approach the shift by <clears throat> maybe applying a six millimeter shift up top. So matching to the upper spine, and then I would go into the room and maybe pull the hips over to fix that, that crookedness. So, um, let's look at this match. It was rejected. We could see that down here, um, uh, because there's an X here. And so, uh, the doctor didn't like this for some reason. And so, um, let's see here, let's see why they didn't like it. So it looks like again, the, the patient is a little bit crooked. Um, I see a small soup shift here. And so uh, there's another film that the patient has taken. Let's look at that. This one was approved. This is offline review. So it looks like they corrected the, uh, the crookedness. And so um, I do still do see another soup inf shift. So uh, another key piece of advice I'll ask is think about what you're treating. What are we treating? Here it's the spleen, uh, which uh, if the patient still has is going to be enlarged. And um, we have a lot of information here in the film, but we're also missing some. So the splenic region would be kind of around here. And uh, let's enhance our contours a bit so we can see the treatment areas kind of roughly around here. So it looks like we're treating maybe some mediastinal nodes or some nodes running along the spine. Um, so looking at this, I would say this whole area here is information that we probably don't need. And so what we could have done is move the panel for the imager over to the patient's left, and then maybe include more of this area here, uh, which would be a little more helpful. So these are kind of things that we can do to think about while we're imaging. What is it that we're trying to see? What can we do to highlight the treatment area and maximize our, our overall visibility? So uh, it's, it's, not, it's a good thing to do to move the panel over as long as you're including all the treatment site and you're getting good information because we're cutting off the rib cage here. And so that's kind of what I would do there. So I have a question. Um, actually, let's skip that. You guys did a good job answering that earlier. So there's no need to answer that again. <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is a scheduled double exposure for a four field breast. So we can see that we have some images scheduled on our right superclav field, and we have something scheduled on our medial film. 
let's go ahead and break that down on what that might look like in a, a process of filming and matching. So I have some notes that I want to go over with you real quick regarding breast setups. Um, we're running close to the end of time um, and I do have one more site. So I'll try to go through this quickly and then we'll answer any questions. Uh, breast cases are one of the most common and one of the most involved treatments. And over time, you'll develop an approach to these setups and matches. Uh, because there are so many things we need to look at, it's important to develop good routines and start making good habits earlier on. In general, there are two different ways that we can plan two field, um, I'm sorry, three field and four field breasts. Uh, one is monoisocentric and the other is non-monoisocentric. This example that we'll be looking at is known as monoisocentric, meaning the supraclaft field shares the same iso as the breast field. It's important to note that because when you shift on one field, it's going to directly impact the other. So you want to make sure that you're happy with the entire match and the positioning before moving forward. It's not good practice to move the patient or shift the table anytime um, and you, you start treatment. So it's not good to match the superclav here, treat it, and then make a shift or move the table um, for the breast field afterwards. And we'll talk about why. So we start by taking the film. This is a double, so we can see the small closed and then the open, a larger one to um, give us more information to perform our match. So the anterior view, this super clap field will allow us to establish our soup to inf and left to right. A major part of this setup depends on the arm and clavicle position. So it's important to make this a good starting point. <clears throat> In this example, the therapist took a double exposure. Um, some policies will require you to do that. We talked a little bit about that earlier, but you want to make sure no matter what, you have enough information to do your match. So you want to be able to see the neck here, the clavicles, the humeral head, the, the chest wall, all this, all this stuff is good to know and have uh, to do your match. So um, look at the surrounding anatomy. It's extremely important for these setups. They guide us on our match and we want to make sure that we're protecting them. So structures such as the lung, the humeral head, the heart, the esophagus, protect all of those <clears throat> and um, review them when you're doing your match. So the main purpose is to review the overall anatomy. And if we don't have enough information, uh, this question was asked before, go ahead, refilm. And remember to use those filters that we talked about and uh, the proper techniques to get good, good images. All right, let's see where we are. Okay, let's continue. So when matching uh, non-mono or mono-isocentric pans like this one, um, there's some principles to consider. So the importance of positioning is greater. And this is because shifting the table or moving the patients in between the fields while after they've been treated can create what are called hot spots. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, Monoisocentric plans have two or more fields that are typically overlapped or matching. They abut each other. The match line is the line or the edge shared between the two fields. Hot spots occur where there are overlaps, increasing the dose in this area. So this will happen if you treat one field and then make a shift and create an overlap and then treat the second field. Cold spots occur when there's gaps um, and the planned dose just doesn't reach these areas. Again, this can happen when you shift between the fields uh, after you start treatment and you create a gap instead of an overlap. So it's very important that you sort of make sure the overall position is very good before proceeding and that you're not going to be matching in between. So um, the couch can help us make these adjustments. And this was a question from earlier. <clears throat> there are just some things that the couch cannot correct for us. So it's important to decide when to move the patient, when to use the couch. Um, the arm has a huge impact on this overall setup. So this is a very important area to look at with breast setups and your imaging. If this is off, you can sort of get it on with the couch, but if it's off enough, it's you're going to have to go in the room and, and adjust this. So that's something that you want to pay good attention to. So things like the clavicle position, uh, you'll want to do by hand. Uh, the head, 
you want to move the head. Um, you can't fix that with the couch. You'll have to ask the patient to turn their head so that we're treating less of the jaw. And um, those are some of those uh, considerations that you want to make. So let's take a look at the image now, going back and forth. Everything's looking pretty good. Um, some of the things that we want to look at, pay attention to, we kind of discussed this just now is, is the, this area, the apex where the lungs start is a very good place to, to, to look at and start your match to make sure super imp is good. Um, our chest wall to see if the patient's crooked, look at the head position. Uh, a lot of times you want the head to be turned to, uh, avoid dose to the jaw here, the mandible and, um, the breast contour actually is very good to look at. You can see if it's swollen, if there's any swelling, uh, and then the heart. So not a big deal for this one. This is a right-sided breast, but if you're treating the left side, um, definitely have to look at that to make sure that it's not in the field. All right. So there's certain structures that we need to pay attention to during our match. And again, some of them will guide us. Um, the others we want to look at to make sure that we're avoiding. So um, an important structure to consider is the clavicle. The clavicles move with the humeral head and the scapula. So again, um, a lot of this is repetitive. So I'm just going to keep saying it. Make sure that you pay attention to that and that's where it should be. Um, <clears throat> the humeral head is a good structure. Again, repeating all these sites. These are good landmarks and I'm just going to throw them up on the screen for you to take a look at. And the lungs. Okay. So once we've done our work with the superclav field, we can then advance to go ahead and take the medial treatment angle. So we've done our soup to infant left to right. So let's film this medial now and set our depth. So where our initial film gives us information about that left, right, soup, inf, this is where we can go ahead and check the field, the beam's eye view to make sure that the breast is in there. We have flash. Um, we want to make sure the heart is out of the field. Again, not a huge problem on this side, but if you're doing a left breast, um, look at the lung position, overall match, just look at it all. And this image is important because it shows us where the beam will pass through and what's being blocked. So here's where we can apply a shift. <clears throat> and if we can't see anything again, just refill. So here's where we can apply a shift um, by using our isolation shift. So if we look at this, the therapist is going to go ahead and apply a shift. And if you notice the values here, he's only or he or she is only going to apply a vert shift. This can be done um, by holding the shift to one key and then dragging the mouse. And what's going to happen is he's going to match the chest wall here and only apply a two millimeter vert shift. If he did not do that, what would end up happening is you would probably get some vert shift and some lat mixed in there uh, because we're taking an oblique. So this is a good way to isolate and, and, and you might not want to move left to right. You might want to just do the amp post on that one because a left to right would actually, uh, again, have an impact on your super cloud field. So we just put all that stuff on. We put the chest wall on the AP, everything looked great. So if we start moving left to right, uh, we could take ourselves off. So the lateral or the medial, good place to set your depth. So hold that shift one key to set the depth. Um, also, you can look at these areas here. You can you can do the same with your um, right, left, and soup inf. You can hold these keys to isolate those shifts as well. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to pause for a quick second. Uh, let's see, should you she not shield more of the humeral head? My question is the same. Is Okay, so let's look at the first one. So um, you want to you protect the humeral head. Uh, someone earlier mentioned edema. Uh, a lot of these people have uh, axillary dissection or surgery that has occurred in that area where they have nodes removed. And so when their arm is up, it's difficult for them to keep it up. And if it drops over time and we irradiate that, it actually can um, prevent the healing process a little bit, make things a little bit more difficult for the patient. So you also want to stay away from the humeral head as much as possible, that armpit area, if it's not included in the plan, 
to make sure that things aren't becoming more complicated for the patient. So uh, the second question was sometimes the KV generator isn't working. Um, or, so we use MV port and abdomen case, MV results not good. It's difficult to match. Uh, yeah, so again, if you're doing an abdomen with an MV film, uh, you're probably gonna see a lot of gas, a lot of tissue. Um, your spine is gonna be very hard to find. So some of the things you can do is to look for those landmarks. Hopefully the patient maybe has hardware. If they don't have hardware, just do your best to look for anything that's kind of standing out, like the apex. <clears throat> if you're down in the abdomen, um, look for the floating ribs. I know that's hard, hard to see, but just do your best to look for those. And then always before moving forward, get confirmation from the doctor. That's going to be your saving grace. Um, if you can't see anything on the film and you know, get a doctor to give you that second opinion and to prove the film before you treat, that's my advice to you. Um, don't just go ahead and move forward if you're not sure. If you're ever unsure, follow up with the doctors. All right, so here we have some uh, tips, some takeaways for thorax. Um, these are available on the, the handout slide. Uh, can I ask if we should pause or stop or sh um, should I keep moving forward? Claire? Um, Omar, if you've got the time, um, let's just keep going. So sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's super interesting. I want to keep going. I'm learning stuff. So as long okay. as it's okay well, with you, um, we will see this through to the end. <laughs> sounds okay. We'll talk money again. Uh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's keep moving. So, um, here are some takeaways for thorax. I'm just going to go over the basics and then the details. There's a printout that you guys can have. Uh, feel free to look at that. It's on there. Always check the airway for lung volumes. <clears throat> and this is my advice because I've treated many lungs before and uh, they can change significantly over time. They have surgery, they have fluid buildup, uh, their, their lungs collapse. And what you're going to notice is when you're taking orthogs or, or you're looking at the KVs, KVs, and you're, you're seeing the bone, what you're never going to see is what's going on with the lung. And so one of the things that will help you is if you look at the airway contour and if you check your film, you can apply a filter that will show you airway very well. And so if you see the airway is off to the side for some reason, that's a good indicator that something has happened with a lung. Either it's collapsed, uh, maybe some fluid got drained, maybe it's responding to the tumor. And so that is your trigger to do a comb beam and say, hey, like something might be going on inside. Let me take a comb beam to verify. That's happened to me uh, many times and I've caught many many changes in the lung. So when you're doing lung matches and thorax, uh, my advice is to always look at the carina. It's, it's a good, good thing to do window level. Um, again, when you're doing thorax cases, if you're doing a breast or soft tissue, like the lung window leveling can be amazing and filters. Also, you can actually see the tumor in the lung on an AP view sometimes, um, just by using window leveling and, uh, applying a filter. And then again, for breast treatments, just a couple things, look at the arm position, avoid moving the patient between treatments. If it's a mono isocentric plan, uh, for spines, use those landmarks we talked about. Um, someone asked a question earlier about breath hold and gated. Um, if you want to ask a question now, I'll be happy to answer it, but essentially, um, with breath hold or gated patients, you do want to review the diaphragm. So before you didn't, because that was a free breathing patient, a right-sided breast who's probably just breathing through the treatment. But when you are working with a patient who is holding their breath, their diaphragm becomes a little more static, stops moving a little bit. And you want to use that to confirm the proper breath hold. So if the patient's breathing deeper, um, their diaphragm might appear to be more inferior. And if they're breathing shallower, it might be uh, pure superior. And then you can actually coach the patient based on your images. Um, so use those obliques, um, those images, on-demand images to uh, see things that you might, that might be in your way. Um, extremities, for example, hips, just kind of go to an oblique and do on-demand if you need to. And then use contours. Contours are... Um, not only amazing, but they're necessary. That they'll show you everything you need to know. 
going to stop here just for a quick minute. Does anybody have any questions? On, I'm sorry if I skipped over some questions in the chat, but feel free to ask them again. I think there was only one question about uh, using fluoro image imaging on a tree beam. Um, you can't, to my knowledge. So, I, I mean, I'm sure they're working on it and I'm sure it might even be available at this time. Um, I love the Clinax, the IXs, the, you know, you could, uh, you could floor the patient and get however long of a image that you want. And then that might even be great for cranial spinals, et cetera. But as far as I know, uh, for true beam fluoro is not cape. You're not, you don't have that capacity. Now, what I will say though, and this is probably for the next presenter, you can do what's called stitched comb beaming. And what that'll allow you to do is take a comb beam of an area and then add an additional area superiorly or inferiorly to that. So if you have a, a pelvis and para aortic field that your doctor wants you to comb beam, say like a prostate, uh, that that's also getting their para aortics treated and their weekly comb beam, you can get the entire pelvis and you can shift the table a little bit and then comb beam the para aortics and stitch them together and look at that comb beam as a whole. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you. Um, I think they're the only questions at the moment in the chat. I think you've covered all the rest, which is excellent. Very good. All right, let's move on. We're going to go to our <clears throat> final site. So we've covered thorax and let's uh, go ahead and move over to our final site, which is going to be head and neck. Uh, head and neck is, is very complex in that there's a lot going on in such a small space. There's lots of nodes, muscles, vessels, glands. And so um, I call it a sensitive site or a delicate site. And we want really want to give good attention to, to everything in the overall match when we're treating with head and necks. Uh, another reason why they're very challenging, very hard on the patient, probably one of the toughest on the patient's head and neck treatments. And this is because it's going to affect their ability to eat, um, they may be getting two placements because they can't eat, making them sore in the abdomen. Um, there's just a lot going on that's causing them discomfort and pain and weight loss, right? So because they're not eating, they could um, suffer weight loss, which you'll see on the film, and then things start to move around in the neck area. So let's go into our final uh, section. <clears throat> Head and neck sites are very complex. Uh, the head region has anatomy that's more fixed to the bone than say a breast or an abdomen. This makes bony anatomy a great tool for matching. Matching becomes more complicated when working with head and neck cases though. Feels can extend all the way down to the carina. So now we must give attention to the neck, the jaw, the proximal T-spine and the clavicles and more. <clears throat> so some of these are able to move around quite a bit and they're trapped underneath the mask. So let's discuss some critical structures and landmarks for head and neck cases. So we have what I call the anterior cranial landmarks. Here's just a few of them. There's, there's a bunch more, but these basic ones are a very good guide. The anterior cranial landmarks can be reviewed to find pitch and yaw errors. Um, these are great critical structures that should be matched before proceeding with treatment. They should be on. They are clearly defined landmarks that allow us to match fairly quickly and our borders for sensitive structures. You have the pituitary gland, the orbits, the mastoid cells. These are all kind of around that area. And so you wanna make sure that that's matched. The base of skull is another critical structure uh, supported by the atlas. The atlas is C1, uh, the first um, part of the spine. And this should also be matched. So generally when you put the base of skull and the anterior plane, uh, cranial landmarks on, they're both matched your cranium is good. Your brain area is good to go. You're matched and um, you should be able to go forward. Now, with that being said, it's important that you actually take a look at <clears throat> the neck and we'll get more into that later. Uh, the last area that I'm going to point out is the, the spine. And so um, the reason you want to check this is because the spine kind of can move around like an extremity. It's kind of free to move around a little bit. And so we have so many <clears throat> nodes and muscles and glands and things going on here in this area that you want to make sure that this is matched to properly. And even if you're treating the brain, just this area here, 
Um, sometimes the fields go down to include C1 or C2. And so it's important to make sure that this area is looking good because you're treating that area. And so if you focus on this and forget about the neck, you could be missing dose here or including dose that you don't want. Uh, the jaw position should be given good attention as well. Um, the jaw has a relationship with head tilt and the neck. So opening or closing the mouth can displace the head along the pitch. Think, think of it as if you're looking up or down, and it can also flatten or curve the neck. So again, we have nodes, vessels, and glands that live around the jaw as well. <clears throat> and so this is another reason we want to give it good attention. In fact, many head and neck cases are focused around the jaw itself. Uh, these are for like base of tongue, salivary glands, oropharyngeal disease. All of these are kind of right there in that area. And so we want to make sure that those are good. And then finally, um, clavicle placement is important because dose will oftentimes on head and neck cases, dose will go down to the clavicle. So there's some nodes there that we want to treat and you want to make sure that the clavicle is in its proper place. <clears throat> So adjusting the patient is a game with these, in these cases. And it's important to know when to move the patient and how to move the patient. So some movements can be requested by the patient. We can ask them to tilt their head up or down, turn it to the left or the right. Uh, we can ask them to swing their chin to one side or the other. And other errors require us to move the patient by hand. Uh, but overall, it's best to try to use the patient as less as possible but there are times where you'll definitely have to ask them for assistance. And we'll see some of those examples further, like uh, say their mouth is open or something, something like that. So let's look at a, a DRR and film and see what happens when we focus on the cranium. Um, I don't know what's going on with these lines. I don't know how they got there, but they're there. <laughs> oh, I'll get rid of them. All right. Sorry, I'll leave that. Oh, no, no, no worries. <clears throat> so... Um, Let's look at the DRR. This is the DRR. Let's put them together in the film. So we have a little bit of a head rock here if we're, if we're looking at this. And so one of the things we can do, if we toggle back and forth, is see that there's some head tilt. So let's go ahead and put them together and put the base of skull on. So we apply a pitch on the couch, and then we're going to go ahead and match to the, the base of skull and those frontal cranial landmarks. And then we're going to go take a look now to see what we have, right? So as we go back and forth between the film and the DRR, the head looks great. But one of the things that we're noticing is the spine is off. And so this is kind of why it's good to give good attention to the spine. And um, usually when you match to the cranium, it'll tell you what's going on with the spine. And when you match to the spine, it'll tell you what's going on with the cranium. So let's go ahead and actually put the spine on. Let's undo our uh, pitch. Let's take that off. And then let's match to the spine. And now when we go back and forth, the spine is matched, a little kinked, but it's matched. And we can see that there's a chin tilt. So as you're working as a therapist and you kind of gain that experience, you will decide when a patient, when to match the neck, when to match the cranium to kind of tell you what to look for, you know, and, and you'll, you'll discover what's on and what's off, depending on how you match your technique will become a little more robust, but here, uh, we could see that we simply need to maybe tell the patient to bring their chin up and that may fix that area. <clears throat> so let's, uh, go ahead and look at this. This is a lateral view of a match. And this is an example here. <clears throat> So this is something that can't be adjusted using the couch. So the spine is matched. And as we're kind of toggling back and forth, this is an example of a chin tilt that we find. And this is kind of what we were looking at before. So here's an example. And we could simply ask the patient to tilt their head. And so here's uh, another film after they made that adjustment. And we can see that it's much better. But here we see also uh, a jaw adjustment that needs to be made. So here uh, we probably want to ask the patient to close their jaw a little bit. And then once we do that, we can see that the match overall is better. Even the spine and the base of the skull looks uh, better. 
here's an example of um, a lateral where, so we're treating all of this here. Obviously we have all these clips <clears throat> here, post-op post clips. And so here, this whole area is obstructed. We can't see anything. And this is because the patient separation is so great that um, it's all becoming washed out. So this is an example of, if you did wanna see something down here, uh, you could probably make out sternum a little bit. You could increase the energy to kind of penetrate this a little more. Uh, my advice is for someone this, this large, I would probably take an oblique if I needed to see something down here. For this case, you probably have uh, plenty of information to perform your match. But again, if you had some contours to look at that maybe outline the sternum, it would give you an idea if you if you were in the right spot down here. All right, so let's take a few moments to review this one. And um, I'll, I'll take some questions real quick. And uh, you guys can let me know what you think needs to be done to correct this. Uh, but Omar, we've got one question, um, and I have one, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So we've got, um, and this is probably maybe a link back to the thorax that you were just doing. So patients are complaining sure. about pain in their trachea, but they can't swallow either solid food or liquid. Um, so what should they do? And they did, it does say the majority of breast cases. Uh, for breast cases? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so... We want to avoid the esophagus, and that's part of why we want to look at that area and make sure that the patient's head is turned. Um, if they are suffering from that already and they're having difficulty, um, a great resource is to put some notes in the alert for the, your fellow therapists, have them ensure that we're not providing any further dose to the esophagus. So that's the first thing you do. You put an alert in there and say, hey, this patient's complaining about um, difficulty swallowing. Please give attention to the neck. And so moving forward, we'll avoid dose to deal with that problem with the patient. I would also refer them to the nurse and um, also let the doctor know. So usually for these patients, they see the doctor once a week. And so what you can do is you could tell the patient when they bring this up to you is, you know, I'm sorry, you're feeling that way. Um, what, what I'm going to do for you is let the nurses know. And so we can take it further from there. So they know that you're helping them. And then you can let the doctor know and tell the patient to let the doctor know the next time they see um, the doctor on, a, on an OTV visit. You could also, if you want to go above and beyond, you could look at the films on offline review and see if we've been treating the esophagus. If you've been doing a pretty good job avoiding it, then chances are they could be sick. Maybe there's something else going on with their throat. It's not necessarily radiation related. So um, these are all things that all together we need to kind of investigate as a team. So get the nurses uh, tagged in, get the doctor tagged in, let the patient know that we're looking out for them and that they should bring it up with the doctor and then let your therapist know to avoid that area when they're treating. Really great advice. Thank you. Um, and just because I'm a physicist and I don't set up the patients, um, and I've just been watching your slides and the, and the shifts that you have to make, particularly around uh, the head and neck stuff. Um, so how often is it an issue with the immobilization device or the mask uh, not fitting correctly that's causing these um, disagreements in patient positioning? It's, um, it's hard to answer that because um, it's such a common thing that people will tell you it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. But it's it, it's like a hundred percent with every case the mask is a challenge and um, I think for the most part it's a challenge, but it's it's something that we sort of have to deal with as the nature of the treatment, and so we consider it to be normal. So sometimes the patient's head will be tilted, turned, etc. Their neck is a big one that we have to deal with a lot, very often, and you'll have those patients come in that are just perfect. They'll lay down on the table, their neck will be great, their head will be great. But for 90% of the patients, um, it's hard to get it perfect. And it's just because the nature of the mask pushing down on them, um, the, their pain and discomfort from the overall treatment and having to deal with their disease. So it can be quite difficult. And so head and necks require a great amount of attention when, when treating and responsible therapists should be looking at all of these structures. Because like I said, you have sensitive glands and nodes and, and muscles and volumes in there. 
And that's one of the reasons why head and necks are monitored so closely for weight loss and why also cone beams are quite common for head and necks. You know, it's, it's very rare that you'll see, um, a non V mat, I, uh, you know, IMRT head and neck, unless there's like a, a lip, a lip the node growth on the side or something that we're just trying to hit with static fields. Absolutely. No, I mean, or of, of all you guys who have to set these patients up every day for their treatment. Um, it's super impressive. So, yes. I will say everyone you. needs a raise. Yeah. Give everybody a raise because yeah, they, sure. therapists, they do a lot. They are, uh, they're amazing and th there's a lot that they struggle with. So absolutely. Give them a raise. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, right. so I, I um, think there's no more questions, so we can move on if that's okay with you. Yep. Yeah. Very good. So um let's match the base of the skull. Um, so I asked, you know, how this needs to move. The neck was moving around a little bit, um, uh, and the head was bobbing back and forth quite a bit. So what that actually tells us is we can't really do much with the head. So we can't ask the patient to dig their head into the table. That's that's not gonna work. And so, uh, what I would recommend is actually mashing to the skull. So what I'll do is I'll mash the skull for you guys. You can take a look here. So that's on. And as we go back and forth, it becomes more clear that it's the neck. The neck is moving, uh, ant post. So we can see that here. So how do we correct for this? Well, when we're looking at the spine, we can either pull the patient up into the mask. And what this is going to do is compress the spine and create more of an arch. So it's going to basically take this and kind of bend it like this a little bit more, create more of an arch, or we could pull them down. And what that's going to do is flatten their spine. So this is what we want to accomplish. And this is what we have. So we want more of an arch. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull the patient up and that's what this therapist did. And so once they pull the patient up, um, the match looks good. So let's just go over some AP view. Now we broke it up into lateral and AP. We looked at lateral. So AP landmarks are the orbits, nasal septum, uh, and frontal sinus for the AP view. There's, there's many, many, many more, but these are kind of the main ones. And these are good for identifying um, three-dimensional errors. So you could use these to find yaw, you can use these to find roll. And so um, if you're looking at the orbits, <clears throat> let's see here. If you're looking at the orbits, um, you can usually determine uh, the relationship here, which is from the edge of the orbit to the side wall, this like line here kind of shows you. And that if it's going to favor one side, so the orbit is going to appear to be closer to one side of the skull than the other, that's going to tell you that there's a head turn. And there's other relationships such as the nasal septum will be veering away from the center of the face. This will tell you that there's a role as well. Moving the patient, um, moving down the body, uh, always review the spine and the clavicle placement. So one of the most common adjustments we need to make from this AP view is to pull the patient to one side or the other to correct a bend in their spine. So we'll see a bend um, kind of in the middle of their spine here. Dose often runs down to the clavicles. So um, it's important to make sure that the arm position is, is where it needs to be. So if the clavicle is appearing to be lower or higher, something we could do to correct for that is to pull the arm down or push the arm up. So here we can see that the patient needs to be pulled to the right. Do we see that swing on the spine? I would even look at the clavicles and say that the clavicles uh, need to be adjusted as well. So let's take a look at this match um, and uh, evaluate it. These are a bunch of offline reviewed images that have deltas or change requests. Uh, so let's take a look at this one. This one was rejected. Um, I would ask, can you guys tell me why this was rejected? Claire, you want to answer this one? Oh, okay, now you're testing the limits. You're testing my limits. Uh, can you run it again? Yeah, let me see if I can see run it again. Images. <laughs> so it looks like the like the clavicle to me looks like the thing that's out. Yeah. 
you can see a little bit in the spine, there's a, a roll and pull, but definitely the clavicle is a big one. It looks like um, there may be dose going down there. And so it wasn't where it needed to be and got rejected. So I would say the clavicles are something to look at. You could actually look at the um, the orbits and the, the, the wall of the skull here where this arrow is, and that'll show you that there's a little bit of a roll. And if you look at the nasal septum here, you'll see that they're moving away in the spine. They're all kind of moving in a way when we go back and forth that show us there's a head turn. It's slight, but you become more of an expert when you when you keep looking at them. But um, so yeah, yeah. Roll, now you've roll. pointed it out. It's so obvious, Emma. <laughs> all right. So these are some uh, takeaways for head and neck. Um, I'm just going to put these up and go over the main points. Uh, look for the anatomical relationships. Look for the relationships between the orbits, the base of the skull, the side of the head, the the nasal septum. All of these things will give you insight on how the patient needs to move. Do they need a head turn, et cetera? And review all the landmarks. They are extremely critical in head and neck structures. Uh, a lot of head and necks are very complex because we have nodes all around that we're treating at different doses. And so we might be going to a higher dose to this one single node up here in the neck and then going to a larger dose to a general area lower. So make sure that all these areas are sort of matched to and they look good before moving forward. Uh, use pitch with caution. If you do apply a pitch, uh, remember that example, it's going to affect the top and bottom of the image. So if you apply a pitch and put the head on and everything looks great, uh, just know that the bottom might be off now. So just look at everything when you use pitch or roll or anything like that. And moving the patient, just kind of know when to move the patient, uh, pull them down to flatten their spine, move them up to arch their spine, uh, make sure their arms are in the right place to fix the clavicle and always as a reminder, pull, never push. It's always better to pull the patient. Look for special instructions for head and necks. If you're treating uh, a larynx, for example, uh, more often than not, you don't want the patient to swallow because that's gonna be moving around. What you're treating is moving around. And so just look for those special instructions, et cetera. Uh, good answer. I see clavicle, roll clavicle. Yeah, those are all correct. So, um, I'm going to pause here to see if anybody has any final questions before I throw that la the last three slides on. And then I have a bonus question at the very end. So we're at the very end. I know we went over guys and you guys are amazing for staying awake. No questions. If they uh, pop up, I'll I, go ahead I, I and address those. I think you're explaining it so well. So. <laughs> so these are, this is the final slides. Um, again, these are notes. You guys will have access to this in the printout. So I'm not going to go too far into these. I'm just going to scroll through them, keep them up for a second or two. Just take a look at them. Uh, these are some good tips. And if you want more detail about anything that we talked about or have any kind of questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. And then I have a bonus question at the very end to ask you guys. Again, you guys have access to this. So if you want it, please reach out. Um, you can print it or save it to your phone and you'll be able to look at it there. So here's the bonus question. Um, it's probably easy for everybody here, but who can tell me the difference between 2D, 2D and 2D, 3D when you're matching? And I do see our, your question, uh, Umer. I'll definitely get to that in a moment. But Umer, if you know the difference between uh, 2D, 2D and 2D, 3D, you can tell me. And Claire, if you know the answer to this too, I'll let you answer as well. You're testing me. I'm testing you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let the okay, others have, so, a, have a guess first. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll give it another quick minute and then we'll jump into the answer. Yeah, just type your guesses in the chat, guys. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, Hi, Chris. Uh, when you talk about the CD, CD, you're talking about 
going to do. Chris, it's really hard to hear you. Can you get closer to your microphone? What are you talking about? 2D, 2D. You're talking about doing like imaging and looking at the image in two dimensions. But when you mention 2D, 3D, you are trying to add volume to it now. Making sure you can view from different, it's for increased perspective. From the lens, from the this, and then from the thickness of the volume. To see how the really will go well. Okay. Well, I think I think part of what you're saying is is correct. Uh, it was a little bit difficult to hear you, but I heard some of it, and I see some answers here on the chat. Um, orthogonal versus CBT, CT. I don't know if that's, those are questions or answers, but we can get into that too. Um, so, I, I think I see an answer there. Three three D is CBCT. So that that whoever that is is onto something. But um, let's explain that. So whenever you take a orthogonal pair and you're matching it and you're online, there is a tab at the bottom corner of the screen where you're matching. And you can actually select um, 2D, 2D or 2D, 3D. So the difference between the two is 2D, 2D will take your two-dimensional AP or lateral that you took and it will match it with the two-dimensional DRR, that dosimetry plan. And so you're working with the 2D, 2D match. Um, both images are 2D, 2D. The benefit to this is it's a lot speedier to perform your match. It's a lot quicker. And the DRR is already there. And so it's probably a little bit more clear. So this is this is uh, good to use when you are just matching to say bone. I heard that answer out there. Um, I would say this is a good one to use. 2D, 3D is a little bit different. It takes your 2D image that you just took on the true beam. And then what it does is it takes a 3D image um, that it pulls from the cone beam, the, not the cone beam, sorry, the CT scan that you guys do. So every patient has a CT scan. And so what happens is when you apply a shift and you're matching, it isn't the image that you took that's moving. It's the image, it's the DRR that's moving. So whenever you're performing a match and you're hitting that, that, that click button on the keyboard and you're moving the image, it's the DRR that moves. And so when you do 2D, 3D matching, it moves the DRR, but it also updates the DRR using the CT that you did from SIM. This is great for when you're applying a pitch or a roll or any kind of three-dimensional adjustment, because what it's going to do is it's going to reconstruct the DRR, and it's going to look a lot clearer and more accurate when you're applying that roll. If you try to do a roll in a 2D, 2D, it will let you do it, but what you're going to notice is that your image is going to look flat. It's going to literally take that image and roll it on a flat plane, and it's going to be a lot less accurate. So 2D, 3D is great for when you're applying pitch and roll and those 3D adjustments. And 2D, 2D is great when you're just quickly doing an APPA on a femur or an extremity or a hip. Um, this will do it faster. Does that make sense? Sure, it does. Very exactly. good. Yeah, that's, that's the main difference. All right. So um, that wraps it up. I will take any other questions. I can I can go back and read. I think there was a, a lot of stuff written, but um, I want to thank you guys for joining me for session 10. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, raises for everybody, bonus points for staying awake. Um, the next session is going to be session 11 which is image matching workshop in CBCT. So if you guys like home beams, that's coming up next. If you guys do have any questions, um, I am happy to answer anything that you guys want to throw. And if you guys have comments too, please leave them or advice. Um, I'm happy to learn. I'm always ready to learn something new. Wow, Omar, that was unbelievably good. Unbelievably good. Um, I've learned a lot. And that's saying something at quarter past midnight where I am. <laughs> so, um, you know, your, your animations were amazing. Um, all the advice that you gave throughout the slides and also answering the questions is just super practical. Um, so I'm sure it's not only me that's going to walk away from this presentation, um, being able to do things better uh, in the clinic. So thank you so much for that and 